So next to me there is Andrew Keen. You had an inspiring uh, speech at the Median Tag in München about the, yeah, the broken future. So you wrote a book um, um, and the, 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 the perspective is not so enthusiastic. So what is broken right now? What's broken, and that's the book, How to Fix the Future, it's a German version, it has an English title, but it's a German translation. Uh, what's broken is that we were promised that the digital revolution would create a level playing field in economic and cultural terms, would empower everyone, would introduce really amazing new business models where everyone would win because the stuff would be free and companies could make money, that would create jobs, would redistribute wealth, and would create a kind of cultural understanding of everyone talking to one another. And all we've got is fake news and hatred against minorities, trillion dollar companies and the potential mass unemployment that's going to be created by AI. And above all else, the destruction of privacy of individualism through companies like Google and Facebook, which have turned all of us into the product. They give out their products for free and they mine our most intimate data in order to make money. So the revolution so far has been deeply disappointing. It's supposed to create a level playing field, it's supposed to empower and engage, and, and in many ways it hasn't. doesn't mean it hasn't been great in other ways. Obviously, digital is very exciting. It's changed all our lives, but for many of us, not for the better. Plus, we've got lots of other things like technological addiction, uh, which is increasingly yeah. clear, uh, the rise of sort of digital politicians like Donald Trump, who's an extreme narcissist and an anti-democrat. So a lot of things to worry about. The future at the moment is broken. I'm from Silicon Valley. We're responsible for the future. We broke it, so now it's our opportunity to fix it. That's But why I wrote this book, How to Fix passed, the Future. Didn't we already pass the point of no return? Absolutely not, no. We're still in the fairly early stages of this. Uh, I joked in my speech that we're in the 60th minute if, in a soccer game when um, the Germans start to win, especially if they beat the English. But um, uh, I think we're in the, still the early stages. Um, we still, the, the, the major new technologies, particularly AI, is still in its relative infancy. Uh, quantum technology is in its infancy, augmented reality, virtual reality, blockchain. All these technologies are going to be radically disruptive. So we have time to change it. But there's no app to fix the future. There isn't a technology that will fix the technological future. Only humans, you and I, can fix it. That's the core message of my book. Uh, the future will be fixed through human agency, through us shaping our technology, rather than that technology shaping us. But the path of innovation that we see right now, and the way we handle the path of innovation, there's a total dysfunctionality in that. Explain what you mean. Um, so the, 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 the speed where we see new innovations, for instance, like blockchain, you just mm. mentioned it, or AI, is very, very fast. But the way how people um, get, uh, get, get, get to know how to handle these technologies yeah, okay. is very, very slow. So how well, do that's we... That's always been the case with new technology. We've always been, um, we've always been intimidated by speed. We've, uh, it was the same at the turn of the 20th century. A uh, German historian wrote a book called um, the vertigo years about the new technologies of industrialization that seem to speed everything up beyond the power of humans to keep up. Um, so we need to keep up. We can, we can go faster. Um, I, I think the idea that this technology is too fast for us and it's way ahead and therefore there's not much we can do, that's part of the problem. There's no reason why we can't catch up with the technology. In your book, you were coming up with five ideas how to fix the future, like five pillars. One is the power to consumers. Um, what are the other pillars? Well, I think regulation is really important. That's where Europe's a leader. Um, laws, regulations around data protection, laws around monopolies, antitrust, laws around punishing companies like Facebook for publishing illegal or offensive uh, material laws about forcing companies like Apple to pay their taxes. Regulation is key. Doesn't mean regulation is the only solution, but it is very important. Innovation is also really important. We need a new generation of entrepreneurs who can learn from the past, not to, to drink the Kool-Aid of Silicon Valley and believe that you can have business models where everyone wins, to be more respectful to consumers and to produce products, to sell products, that reflect the consumer's real interest rather than take advantage of them. We need citizen engagement, whether it's parents or teachers. 
or industry leaders, even in Silicon Valley, like Mark Benioff, who will use their wealth to make the world a better place. Uh, we need lawyers to stand up for the rights of the precariat, the new class of Uber drivers and Airbnb renters who have been created by the new digital economy. And we need a new education system that will teach people or remind people how to be human in the age of the AI, in the age of the algorithm where we in most respects are, are creating technology that not only replicates us, but beats us. Beats us in chess and go and figuring out medical problems and legal problems and driving vehicles. So, ironically enough, it's not going back to the future. In my book here, uh, the chapter on education focuses on Waldorf education, the idea of which was created by Rudolf Steiner just after the First World War in Vienna. So many of the ideas in the book are old. We've always had, as humans, the future has always been broken. It's our story as a species, you, you and I and everybody else in the world. We always break the future and then we always fix it. But this time we've broken it in a pretty bad way and it's really, really important for us to, to get on fixing it because if we don't, if we don't address these issues over the next, say, quarter century, over the next 25 years, it may indeed be too late. But most uh, things you're talking about, like regulation, education, um, law, laws and things like that, are um, done locally in, 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 in countries or in, in the European Union or, or in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a collaboration with some countries. But the technology itself is globally, so like, uh, like AI. So there's an invention somewhere, somewhere in the world and these inventions, uh, innovations uh, come, uh, come across borders. Um, so how do you... How do, you, how do you put this in operation, what you say? Like, how do you regulate? How do you... Well, you can't... Um, that's an interesting point. And I think one of the great dreams of the original internet was that you'd have a... It's a utopian dream. In other words, it wasn't realizable that there would be some sort of global technological community where everyone would be connected in what Tim Berners-Lee called the World Wide Web. The reality, though, is that culture and territory is always real. And one of the ironies of the digital revolution is it's actually made territory more valuable. That's why in the digital age it's not surprising that you have the rise of anti-immigrant parties and the increasing fetishization of territory and soil. Um, Eric Schmidt, the reality is the what people call the splinternet, the fragmentation of the internet into many different markets. Eric Schmidt says, the former, he, he predicted recently, the former executive president of, of Google, very influential and wealthy and smart guy, he said there's going to be two internets in the future, the, the American internet and the Chinese internet. I'm not sure of that. I think there may be a European internet as well. I think the Chinese internet is really terrifying. It's the sort of rebuilding of 1984 along digital principles and will be very effective. Everyone will be watched and everyone will be rewarded or punished according to their political loyalty to a totalitarian creed. We'll have a European internet that, that will be more regulatory, that will create a, a more level playing field and enable entrepreneurs to create interesting new companies. And an American internet that may be increasingly marginalized and parochialized as America is itself. I'm not so concerned about the fragmentation of digital. I think that that, in a way, represents its maturation. It means that it's actually becoming real because the vision of a global technological community was never real. It never reflected the reality of human existence. Um, and I think that having different rules for different technologies in different territories is really interesting. So to come back to your question, Let's say in Europe they all agree that certain kinds of AI technology, when it comes to warfare for example, should be illegal, then it will be banned here. It may not be banned in the US or China, but Europeans can't determine policy there. In, in America, uh, abortion may be illegal. In Europe it isn't. That's just the nature of society. But we have also other guidelines like the community guidelines, the regulations of the platform itself. So if you see platforms like Google and Facebook, you just mentioned them, they have their own rules, they have their own internal guidelines and some things they allow in their platform or they deny on their platform are totally away from what's uh, the, the, the state of the law right now. Sometimes it's uh, for, for instance, you can do more or less on the platform that's allowed in one country. For, for instance, you just mentioned China. So the, in, in China, you have a strong regulation um, for, 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 of the law, but you have, a, you have platforms where, is, um, where you can do more, but the platforms are not available in China, for instance, but people are trying to use the platform uh, anyway. Yeah? 
But I, I'm not clear what your point is. Yeah, the point is um, ju just, it's just an, a, another perspective uh, to your point that you, you mentioned just the, the Chinese internet, the European internet, the American internet, but so far we have like a lot of people would be would be totally uh, fine if they just would have Facebook or just would have Google. They don't need another internet like the Facebook, like, like an internet outside Facebook, like the walled garden structure we had a couple of years ago. So is this another perspective that we have the the, the, the European internet, the Chinese internet, but we have also walled gardens built by big companies where they produce a product that is maybe free for everyone, but they keep you uh, in that garden? Well, I, I think your point is, uh, in a sense, you're making two points. You're saying on the one hand, you have the reality of national laws, which determine digital policy in different countries. So you can access Google in China, but it's a, a, it's a censored Google. Yeah, it's uh, another Google, a different. Uh, and you can do the same in Europe, but it's not censored. Um, And on the other hand, you're saying that, that, that these, these technologies like Facebook are walled gardens, but the reality is that they're not walled gardens because regulatory policy affects them. So it can't really be a walled garden. I think, I don't like this term walled garden. It implies that, that there is the possibility of extreme openness, which probably isn't the case. The world is, is a walled garden. Um, society is a walled garden countries, states, laws are walled gardens and there's nothing wrong with walled gardens. You can build beautiful gardens within walls so we should get away from that kind of language. It smacks of utopianism, it smacks of the idea that we want to break down walls. Walls aren't bad things. Okay. Do you so, like walls? Um, I like the idea of the image of a walled garden to compare Facebook to other, uh, other um, ecosystems on the internet because you have on the one hand, you had these APIs like application programming interfaces, but as you see that they just uh, shut down some APIs, it's closer and closer also for Instagram and YouTube and Twitter. So they, 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 they used to be more open in the beginning of the Web 2.0 in my opinion, but it's my personal perspective. Mm. Well, I think that wall gardens are a reality. I think that that's the nature of human existence and that's how we best live. I think without walled gardens, not only do you have anarchy, but you also have a winner-take-all mentality. So without walled gardens, you have trillion-dollar companies. Within walled gardens, you have less powerful companies, you have a more level playing field. So we shouldn't be shy of building walls. As long as they're scalable, uh, and, that, uh, and, as, and as long as there's consensus about building them. The problem is, is when those walled gardens become a prison. In China, they're becoming a prison. China is increasingly becoming a huge digital prison, quite similar to the one that Jeremy Bentham imagined in his Panopticon, a place where everyone is watched all the time, where there's no mutual transparency, where the state holds all the power and citizens are intimidated and punished if they're politically incorrect, if they don't toe the totalitarian ideology of the regime. So what, I'm much more worried about what's happening in China than I'm worried about what's happening in the so-called walled gardens of digital American digital companies. One last question you just mentioned in your uh, opening speech that AI might be our last innovation. What do you mean by that? I was actually quoting someone else. Some people believe that AI will be our last invention because out of the algorithm, out of artificial intelligence, uh, you will get technology which is self-conscious, which is able to think for itself. And, and in that sense, you will get technology that's essentially superhuman. And it, 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 if, if that happens, if we do indeed create algorithms that are not only smarter than us, but are self-conscious, then we will become enslaved to those algorithms. So that's the, that's the, the ultimate sort of Hollywood-style dystopian end to this technological narrative, that the technology will become so smart that we will be enslaved by it. People like Bill Gates and Elon Musk believe that's a possibility. I personally don't. I think in the next 100 years at least, it won't happen. But we need to make sure through my pillars, through regulation and innovation and consumer demands and citizen engagement and education that we don't fall into the crap of, uh, not the, the crap, the, that was a Freudian error, the trap, <laughs> the trap. Of, uh, 
of, uh, of, of creating technology that will enslave us, that will essentially end our, uh, the, the history, the, at least the independent history of our species. So it's on us to fix the future? It's on us, agency, you and I, humans, don't rely on blockchain or other technologies, don't rely on an app to fix the future. My book begins it, but it's a collective responsibility of all of us, just as it was in the Industrial Revolution. Okay, so it's going to take a generation, it takes a lot of work, there is no simple solution, but we can fix it if we work on it together. Okay, so let's fix the future with some of your ideas. Thank you, Andrew Keen. Thank you, good Thanks job. For